Hello. Hi. Is the mic picking me up? Yeah. Okay. Um, can I see how many people is um, raise a show of hands if this is your first time at the writers' conference here? Awesome. Okay. I'm going to tell a little bit of story of my first time. It was Father's Day 2003 when I rolled up Oak Drive for the first time, wondering where the hell I was supposed to turn to find the place to check in at my first ever writers' conference. The left side of my face and my arm were red with sunburn from my six-hour trip west. I had misjudged the time and arrived later than I expected. I had to go to the bathroom. I was tired and anxious and deeply skeptical that coming here at all was the right decision. When I got out of my car, the first person to greet me was a dark-haired Colgate newly minted graduate whose face resembled someone I had known for a long time, although I could never remember who. It's likely that Jennifer Smith has no idea of the power and comfort of her smile, but I never forgot how much she made me feel like I belong during those first moments at my first Colgate Writers Conference. A decade later, I believe that innate warmth and kindness is part of why Jenny has been such a successful writer of young adult fiction. I think it's what Whitney Joyner was talking about in a recent New York Times book review of Jenny's latest novel, The Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight, when she describes Jenny's respect for her young characters and for their maturity and capacity for psychological insight. When I read Jenny's book, The Comeback Season, I was also struck by the strength of her young characters and by her courage as a writer to put them in difficult and sometimes irredeemable situations. Those of us who don't read a lot of young adult fiction may tend to think of it as less serious than the adult kind, but Jenny's work reminds us that younger characters experience what they experience is no less heartbreaking and soaring and visceral and life-changing in fact, even more so. What a thrill to see her back at Colgate year after year with a new title under her belt, four altogether now, one coming out in April, right? Um, and a movie in the works. I have to mention this real quick. Um, Dustin Lance Black, the Oscar-winning screenwriter of Milk, is working on a screenplay and uh, directing the statistical probability of love at first sight. So that's totally exciting. <laughs> So you want to hear Jenny and not me, I've just got two more sentences. Jennifer E. Smith is the author of The Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight, The Storm Makers, You Are Here, and The Comeback Season. She earned a master's degree in creative writing from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, currently works as an editor in New York City. Her work has been translated into 28 languages, I think as of today, 30 countries, in 30 countries, and her new young adult novel, This Is What Happy Looks Like, it's coming out in April 2013. Jenny Smith. Uh, well, thank you so much, Hope. And can everybody hear me? Um, thank you so much. And I just also wanted to say thank you to Matt and Jennifer and Peter and Cody and just everybody who sort of makes this conference work year after year. This is, it's not my 10th year at the conference, but it's my 10th anniversary of my first year. Can you guys hear Jenny? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, um, I, I turned it off to change the screens. I'm sorry to be part of this. It's not appropriate. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. I was just basically saying thank you to everybody. <laughs> so um, I, this conference, uh, I was just saying this is my, this is not my 10th year at the conference, but it's my 10th anniversary of my first year at the conference. I think I missed one year. Um, and it's just, it's become a really big part of sort of my creative life, and I really look forward to every summer. I've started two of my books while at this conference. Um, including the one I'm going to read from tonight. I started it last year here. And um, so thank you. It's a great, it's a great place. And um, so I, I had to check on my train ride down today. To, to, I couldn't remember what I'd read the last two years, so I had to check the video. Um, and it turned out I'd read from Statistical Probability the last two years in a row. So I'm going to read from the new book tonight. This is what Happy looks like. And it's the first time I've read from this. And uh, it just it seems fitting since I started it here last year. So. Um, <coughs> I'm going to read from chapter four, which means that this requires a little bit of setup, which I hate to do, but bear with me. Um, the book starts with an email that goes astray and sparks a sort of unlikely correspondence between two teenagers on opposite sides of the country, Ellie, who lives in a small town in Maine, and Graham, who lives in LA. Um, and a few months after this first exchange, um, a movie set comes to Ellie's hometown for the summer, and um, 
you know, with it comes Graham, who turns out to be the star of the movie, unbeknownst to her, um, and this is the person she's been writing to the whole time. So um, on the first day he's there, he sort of figured it out, and that's why the movie's there, and he goes to the ice cream shop where she works and to ask her to dinner so that he can tell her that they've been writing to each other and accidentally asks out her best friend who had spilled on her shirt and is wearing Ellie's uniform instead of her own. Um, so the book sort of starts as a little bit of a comedy of errors. And this, book, this chapter begins when Graham is on his way to dinner with the wrong girl, basically, and doesn't know it yet. So this is chapter four. The light off the water was golden in the last hours of the day. Graham took the long way to dinner, cutting over to the beach, where he paused every now and then to pick up a stone, weighing it in his hand before letting it fall back to the ground. All day, the smell of the ocean had been calling to him. A couple of sunburned tourists walked by with beach chairs under their arms, but neither of them bothered to look up as they passed, and Graham felt a little shiver of delight. After the first movie came out, it had been the opposite. Each time someone recognized him in public, it was like a benediction, like in some strange way he was being knighted. Graham Larkin, somebody. But now, now it was the lack of recognition that made his heart thump in his chest, that small thrill of anonymity which had become such a rare thing these days. He glanced at his watch, realizing he would soon be running late, but instead of heading back up to the road, he turned to face the ocean squarely, watching the light skip off the water. There were still a few boats on the horizon, silhouettes against the sun, and Graham had a sudden longing to be out there too. He remembered a fishing trip he'd taken with his father when he was only eight, the two of them bobbing in the little rowboat, their necks lost in the orange life jackets. For three days, they tied their bait and cast their lines and caught nothing. Dad kept apologizing like it was his fault the lake refused to offer anything up. And as the last afternoon began to wear thin, he only looked more miserable. This had been his idea, the kind of bonding trip he'd taken with his own father. And he'd been telling Graham for months now about all the fish they'd surely catch. Salmon, Graham had asked, and Dad shook his head. Probably not, he said. They're tougher to find, but trout, lots and lots of trout, you'll see. They hadn't brought anything else for dinner, he was that certain, and so the previous night they'd eaten beef jerky and string cheese out on the cabin porch, swatting away the mosquitoes and listening to the thrum of the crickets. They were close to giving up that last afternoon when it occurred to Graham to tie some of the beef jerky to the end of the line. Dad had sat forward, the little boat rolling back and forth, and his eyes brightened. That's not a bad idea, he said. Graham was the first one to get a bite, a rainbow trout that flopped and jerked on the line as Dad helped him reel it in. After that it was easy. Dad pulled in three more trout and then Graham caught a small carp. The light was fading and the water was getting dark all around them, but neither of them wanted to stop. It was like magic, like they'd conjured three days worth of fish, a whole weekend's worth of memories, into that last hour of daylight. When he felt one final tug on his line, Graham reeled it in to find a small salmon on the end, silvery and sleek. I guess you proved me wrong, Dad said with a grin. He sat back in the rowboat, his face all lit up, and held up the empty package of beef jerky. Looks like the wrong kind of bait can get you the right kind of fish. Graham was thinking about that now as he turned and cut up towards town, leaving the fishing boats behind. He smoothed the front of his shirt as he passed the movie trailers, now dark and silent. They'd already shot a few scenes on a soundstage in L.A., but there was an air of excitement about being on location, especially in a place like this, and Graham couldn't help getting caught up in it. He'd spent the past two years playing the same character and working with the same actors, so it was refreshing to be doing something different. The new director, the new script, the new co-star, all of it helped him remember why he enjoyed this acting thing in the first place. It was the challenge of it all, being set down in the middle of someone's life like a tourist and feeling your way through it. The lobster pot wasn't far from the beach. Graham could see it as he made his way up the street. It was just after 7.30, which meant that Ellie was probably already in there. Outside there was a knot of photographers, their dark clothing giving them away, even as they tried to look casual among the tourists. A few motorcycles were parked nearby, on more than one occasion, Graham had been chased by them as he tried to slip out of some restaurant or club in L.A. There was a breathless absurdity to these pursuits, and though he understood that they had a job to do, he had little respect for the way they did it, and even less for the people who were so desperate to read what they reported. The truth was, he wasn't really worth reading about. He was a better-than-average-looking 17-year-old guy who occasionally took a pretty girl to dinner and who played a part decently well, but who mostly sat around at home reading books with his pet pig. As he approached, the photographers began hoisting their cameras and calling out his name. He ducked his head as they gathered around him. There were fewer than earlier, only four or five. The rest probably had the sense to go get some dinner or watch TV in their hotel room or call their girlfriends. Those who had stuck it out clicked away like mad, though, the flashes popping as they peppered him with questions, one more relentless than the next. Who's this girl, Graham, asked one of them, a brick wall of a guy with a diamond earring and a head so pale and bald that it reflected the last of the day's light. 
Was this the first time you'd met? Are you too official? He ignored them all, shoving his way past, and when he reached the door of the restaurant, he was greeted by a thick man with enormous arms and a trim beard. Joe Gabriel, the man said, extending a meaty hand. I'm the owner. Listen, you like lobster? Graham nodded, surprised by the question. Good, said Joe. You eat enough lobster while you're in town, and I'll keep these clowns out of here. Deal? Deal, he said, looking past him to see if Ellie had arrived yet. The walls of the restaurant were covered with well-worn buoys and old maritime clocks, fish netting rigged like bunting, and framed paintings of schooners and lobsters and whales. At a seat in the corner beneath a huge iron anchor that appeared to have come straight off a fishing boat, Graham recognized the back of her head, her dark hair pulled up into a low ponytail. All around her, the other tables were empty, and he was grateful to Joe for clearing the way. There was nothing worse than trying to have a private conversation with the faint click of camera phones going off at every angle. Joe waved at the table in case he wasn't sure where to go, and then headed off to the kitchen. But Graham remained where he was, suddenly frozen with uncertainty as he looked over. It wasn't that he was disappointed. How could he be? She was unquestionably beautiful. But ever since leaving the ice cream shop that afternoon, Graham had been trying to work out his feelings about tonight. After all this time and all those emails, shouldn't he be more excited? Shouldn't he be overjoyed? Shouldn't he be something? Maybe the problem was that he'd been forced to read too many scripts with happy endings. Maybe he'd been in Hollywood for too long already. Graham had never been in love before, so he had no idea what to expect. Maybe this was it. You strike up a long-distance conversation with a girl, you enjoy talking to her more than anyone ever before, and then you show up, and she's gorgeous, and you count yourself lucky. But still, he thought there'd be something more. He thought that when he saw her, when their eyes first met, that it would feel different. That all those Hollywood cliches were cliches for a reason. It was supposed to be unmistakable, that feeling, wasn't it? Like a punch to the stomach. But here now in this restaurant, he was feeling curiously empty as he approached the table. When she turned around and their eyes met, there were no stars or fireworks or anything else. There was only the two of them, gazing at each other, each a little bit awkward in their nervousness. Thanks for coming, he managed to say as he slid into his seat. As soon as he did, he realized he should have kissed her cheek, but the moment had already passed. He unfolded his napkin and looked at her from across the table, trying to match up the girl before him with the one who had written to him about how much she loved poetry. Did you have any trouble with the photographer, she asked, her voice a bit shaky. He could tell she was anxious, but he wasn't sure what to do about it. The first few times he'd gone out with girls from home after his face started appearing in magazines, he tried to put them at ease by telling them not to be nervous, but this always seemed to have the opposite effect, and they'd just become more jangly, more pink-cheeked, more self-conscious. He watched now as she twisted a silver bracelet around her wrist, unable to quite sit still. They weren't too bad, he said, nothing like the ones in L.A. I bet, she said, and Graham picked up the menu, trying to think of a way to change the subject. He wasn't sure how to tell her that he was the one she'd been talking to all these months. Should he drop a hint? Ask about her mom or her dog? Mention some random subject they'd already discussed, like her childhood trips to Quebec or her end-of-term paper on Irish poetry? His hands were growing damp with sweat as his mind raced through the possibilities. He'd imagine that once he sat down, the truth would come spilling right out of him. But now that he was here, there was something holding him back, and he swept his eyes around the restaurant and wiped at his forehead. So what's good here, he joked, the lobster? Well, yeah, she said, clearing her throat. It's their specialty. He glanced up at her and forced a smile. I was only kidding, he said, and she flushed a deep red. I think I'll get the surf and turf. So have you ever been to Maine before, she asked, or is this your first time? First time, he said. Before I started acting, I'd never left the West Coast. Wow, she said, I've never been to California. Have you lived here your whole life, he asked, though he already knew the answer from her emails, that she'd been born in D.C. and moved up when she was little. Yes, she said, and he snapped up his chin. My parents, too, and my grandparents. It's sort of a family tradition, this town. Graham leaned his elbows on the table, frowning. Really, he said, your whole life? Yeah, she said, giving him an odd look. Before he could say anything more, the waiter arrived with a shrimp cocktail. Compliments of the chef, he said, setting it between them and then lingering for a beat too long. Thanks, Graham said, and to his surprise, the waiter, a lanky guy with curly blonde hair and a crooked nose, gave him a menacing look in return. Sure, he said, clearly making an effort to sound tough, though his voice was unsteady. He turned his head, he turned ahead back to the bar, but the words that drifted behind him were unmistakable. It's really for Quinn. Even after he was gone, Graham found himself staring across the table in confusion. His eyes narrowed as he tried to locate his question. Sorry, she was saying, that's just how it is in small towns. Everyone knows everyone else, and when you grow up with these guys, they can be a little overprotective. She trailed off when she seemed to notice the look on Graham's face. What, she asked, what's wrong? Are you, he began, then shook his head. I mean, what, she asked again, staring at him. Quinn, he managed, and she nodded. 
guess. Your name is Quinn? Yeah, she said, and then something seemed to click and she threw her head back. Oh man, did I never actually introduce myself? I can't believe I did that. I'm so sorry. Graham's face was still twisted as he tried to work out what was going on. But the shirt you were wearing earlier. Again, he could see a look of understanding pass across her eyes. Ah, she said, I get it now. I had a little run-in with a chocolate milkshake right before you came in, she said, miming an explosion. So I borrowed my friend Ellie's. The name, when she said it, felt like something physical. It seemed to hit him square in the center of his chest. So you're not Ellie? She laughed. No, I'm Quinn. So we haven't been writing emails to each other? Now it was her turn to look baffled. No. Graham was shaking his head in a mechanical motion, and though he was aware of it, he seemed unable to stop. You're not Ellie O'Neill, he repeated, and she nodded again, and we haven't been in touch. What? She asked, no, why? Wait, does that mean you've been in touch with... She let out a sharp laugh. You've been in touch with Ellie? Yes, Graham said, suddenly unable to stop grinning. Look, I'm sorry for the mix-up I really am. I know this must seem really odd to you. Quinn stared at him. You and Ellie. He nodded, then thought better of it and shook his head. Not exactly, he said. I mean, we've never met before, obviously. We've just been emailing, but I don't actually know her. This makes no sense at all, Quinn said, slumping back in her seat. I have no idea what's going on right now. The waiter returned to clear their plates, but neither of them had touched the shrimp. He gave Graham another threatening look before turning around again. Once he was gone, Quinn sat forward. So you and Ellie have been writing emails to each other, she said, her tone matter-of-fact, and Graham nodded. I got in touch with her accidentally a few months ago, and we started writing back and forth. It was one of those things that just sort of happened. She was eyeing him carefully. And now here you are. Right, he said, here I am. In Henley. Yep, he said with a feeble grin, beautiful Henley, Maine. It only took a moment for her eyes to widen as she connected the dots. And is that why? Why what? Why the movie's here this summer? Graham tried not to look sheepish as he shrugged, sort of. Wow, she said almost to herself, and then she said it again, wow. She picked up her water glass but made no move to take a sip. I can't believe she never told me. This whole time she's been pen pals with Graham Larkin and she doesn't even tell me. She closed her eyes just briefly, then blinked them open again. And here she's been going around acting like she could care less that you're in town. The smile slipped from Graham's face and he cleared his throat. Well, in fairness, she doesn't know it's me she was writing, he said, hearing the defensiveness in his own voice. He reached for his glass and took a swig. You probably saw her already, Quinn said. She was right outside Sprinkles when you came in and she's kind of tall with red hair. Graham's heart bounded in his chest and he lowered the glass, thinking of the girl with the green eyes, the one who had been sizing him up. Yeah, I think I did see her. His eyes strayed to the door and he forced them back to the table. That's great, he said, picking up his menu again. I'll just see if I can go find her tomorrow. Across the table, Quinn watched him. He could feel her pointed gaze and after a moment he lowered the menu and looked up at her. Go ahead, she said, and he raised his eyebrows. Go ahead where, he asked, trying to keep his voice steady. But when the cameras weren't rolling, he was a terrible liar and he knew she could tell. Go find her now, Quinn said with a half smile. You've come all this way and I'm not going to make you sit through a whole dinner with me. No, Graham said in weak protest, I'm having a good time. She rolled her eyes. Really, it's fine, she said, casting a glance over her shoulder at the waiter, who was still lingering near the kitchen. I'll make Devin eat with me. She winked at him. And I'll still let you pay. Graham laughed. You're sure? I'm sure, she said, and before either of them could change their minds, he fished a handful of bills from his wallet and laid them on the table, then rose from his seat. She's probably home right now, Quinn said, pointing to the window behind Graham, where the main street of the town had grown quiet as the dusk settled over it. It's the yellow cottage near the corner of Prospect and Sunset. Thank you, he said, and this time he remembered to kiss her on the cheek. She smiled. Tell her to have fun on my date. Just as Graham was about to rush out the front door, Joe appeared at his side. I sent them away, he said, nodding out across the street, but I'm pretty sure they're still around here somewhere, so if you're planning an escape, I'd go out through the kitchen. Graham thanked him and hurried past the pots of whistling lobsters and the chefs in white shirts. Just before slipping out, he paused beside Devin, who had watched him charge into the kitchen with a stunned expression. How do I get to the corner of Prospect and Sunset? Just head down Main Street and take a left onto Prospect, he said, looking flustered. You'll run right into it. Thanks, man, Graham said, and then gave him a little pat on the shoulder as he pushed open the door. He nodded back at the dining room. She's all yours. Outside, he pulled in a deep breath of salty air. The light was fading over the water, and the whole world was steeped in shades of blue. There was a breeze coming from the east that lifted Graham's hair from his forehead, and he felt light on his feet as he set off down the road, propelled by that rarest of things, the promise of a second chance. As he walked past old homes and B&Bs, the light starting to come on in the windows, he thought of the red-haired girl he'd seen just hours ago, the way her eyes had lingered on him, and his heart banged in time with his footsteps, a rhythm that carried him up the street with renewed energy. 
When he saw the sign for Sunset Drive, he slowed down and began to examine each house. It was hard to tell the white ones from the yellow in the dusk, but as he approached a small clapboard colonial, he saw that the porch light was on. And even before he could register its color, he noticed the girl sitting curled on the swing, and he knew that he had arrived. As he walked up the path, she looked up from her book. The light above her was small and buzzing with insects, and it only reached so far in its efforts to push back the gathering dark. When he stopped, she lifted her chin, craning her neck, and Graham could tell from the uncertain look in her eyes that he was only a shadow to her, a mere silhouette. But from where he was standing, he could see her perfectly, the wavy red hair and the oversized t-shirt with a smiling lobster on the front, the way her legs were tucked up beneath her on the swing, and the freckles across her nose. He could see her, and it was just like he thought. It was just like being punched in the stomach.